Okay, should we go? All right, so we're a little bit behind the middle of this slide, my slide, sorry. So I hope you had some coffee, so we were able to finish all of that. Okay, so we were talking about um, administrative markets, right? Um, there are many examples of them. And here I'm gonna show you an example of how, how you can model them, and then I'm gonna show you a very detailed application. I'm gonna try to go fast. So, okay, so think we have a firm that has to uh, to make uh, three choices, an investment level, X, and it has to choose how much to produce in two different periods. Here there is no uncertainty. There are just two different periods. Like it's going to produce for sure in those two different periods. Um, so it's going to sell, for example, power in period two at price one. In, in period one, sorry, in period two, it's going to sell power at price two. Um, Qs are the production quantities. I assume that the production, the, the cost functions are quadratic, and the firm ha, uh, has to make an investment. Because I made everything quadratic, so the function is well behaved. So, and I, have done, I don't have capacity constraints here. So strictly speaking, the investment, uh, it's actually a cost production here. It's like you invest in something, and then you make the operating cost Lower. That, that's how it works. It's a made-up example, just so to illustrate a point. That's it. I, I made it just so I don't have to deal with cons capacity constraints. It's, it's all here, so that makes optimization easy. That, that's that's the only reason. But it's not very realistic. Okay, but all right. So and we have two periods. We have period one with a demand level one. We have period two with demand level two. Right. These are uh, the market clearing conditions. Um, all right, that's it. So if there is no price control, uh, we take we just take the KKT conditions of this problem. Sorry. In the first, in the previous, yeah. Okay. Where the the value of cost will be? It's gonna come. It's gonna come just for measuring welfare. That's it. It's, it's just to, for measure something exposed. That, that's it. That's, uh, we're not gonna curtail the demand. I just uh, to measure it, right? Actually, strictly speaking, we don't really need it because we could also think of minimizing cost. But I just wanted to measure it in terms of welfare. For that, I need to define like how much are people willing to pay for this, and it's just a number, a number that came out. I invented it. Okay. All right. So I take the KKT condition of this problem. Um, it's only one firm, but I assume that it's a price taker. So Try to do the, the three derivatives here. Um, you already know how to write this in complementarity form, right? I do the derivative with respect, sorry, with respect to x, q1, q2. Uh, they have the two market clearing conditions. Uh, I have five variables, five constraints. I have a solution. This is the solution. The optimal investment is 13. Uh, production in Production levels are already defined basically because demand levels are constant. And I found that price one is 140 and price two is 28. And those are the, actually the marginal cost of the firm, those two periods, okay? So if I measure uh, welfare, I measure welfare as the happiness in the system, I get that, that number. I'm going to have to go fast to be able to make it. So now I invent um, administrative constraint. For example, now the regulator says, okay, um, uh, there is a price cap of $100. So prices can never go above $100 because I say you can. Uh, but the demand curtailment is allowed. So we're going to have demand curtailment because, as you saw here, if, if in, in period one the price is $140, but here is $28. So in this period, the, the, the cap is not going to affect production basically unless it changes the investment. But uh, in this period, it's going to change it. So it, it affects the firms, the firm, right? So I have to model now curtailment and the price cap. So I need to add some variables. I need to add a curtailment variable. Basically, I'm going to reduce demand by this amount here. I'm going to reduce demand if this amount by this amount here if there is curtailment. And the curtailment variables are introduced as complementarity constraints. Basically, say, this says, if price, if the price in period one is strictly less than 100, 
then the cartel money is zero. Right, exactly. If we don't violate the, if we don't hit the cap, then there's no cartel money. That's what it says. Okay? And if, if we violate it, then uh, the, the value of that is determined from this equation. If I solve this, surprise, uh, I hit the, the, the price cap here, 100, and that, but the problem is that that changes my investment decision as well. I, I'm going to invest differently if there is a, a, a rule. And here, my optimal investment decision was 13, and here is 1.4. So it changed a lot. And that also indirectly affected the price in the period too. Why? Because I changed my investment. And my investments affect my marginal cost. And that affects the other period too. Even though I don't hit the cap, it still changes. And if I compute happiness here, welfare, it's lower. It's lower than this one. Okay? Because the price cap that the regulator imposes, 100, is not how much cost customers are actually valuing electricity. Customers are willing to pay up to 500 for electricity. But the regulator said, no, 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 up to 100. That's it. Okay, well, then it's going to be some return. Okay, so you lose 25% of happiness. So there is an impact. Okay, there's, here's a more intricate uh, example. The regulator decides that uh, prices cannot be different between the two periods. It has to be only one price. Uh, the price is going to be the average price. Okay? So this is the rule. The regulator said, the price I'm going to pay you firm for what you produce is going to be this average. Okay? So, um, if we go back here, you look at this, and you know that the prices, the optimal prices, are the marginal cost of the firm. Right? There's only one firm. Right? So, the, the optimal prices are the marginal costs of the firm. So, um, the average price can be from from these constraints, right? You can you can find P1 from this constraint, P2 from this constraint, and if you compute the average price, you can express it like this. That's the average price. Okay? And on top of that, the firm the regulator says, no, now you cannot curtail demand. You're not allowed to. I'm, I'm gonna force you to meet demand. Okay? In both periods. So that means that now uh, the production quantities are fixed. The government already decided how much I'm going to produce in, on each period. Okay? So now I already know what's going to be the, the average price beforehand. The only variable left for the firm is the investment. That's it. Okay? So if you see that, you're going to find that if you try, try to plug in this rule into <laughs> these KKT conditions, it's not going to work. You're, you're going to violate this because the firm doesn't want to do that. So you cannot follow this modeling approach to model this part. The, that the regulator is now forcing the firm to do something that violates the KKT conditions of the firm. Okay? So then you need to so do something else. Okay? And here's why we came up with, with a friend Rodrigo Moreno to model administrative markets. One way to model it is to think as the firm, as a firm that invests and then basically gives the firm the plan to the operator or the regulator and forgets about it. Like there, there are no decision variables for the firm in terms of operation. The firm invests, pay for the investment, give the plan to the regulator and receives a payment in exchange for that. And that's it. But the firm is it's like blind to operations because it, the, the regulation doesn't meet the KKT conditions of the firm. So it doesn't make sense to model it. Okay? You violate that. So one way to do it is to just think, look at, at the problem of the firm now like this. It's a much simpler problem. You invest in X capacity. You pay this for the investment. And you give that to the operator, and the operator pays you back a price P for every unit of capacity you put on the table. What's the operator going to do with that? No idea. No idea. Just going to see a price in exchange for that. Okay? 
So the regulator is a, an administrative function to determine that price pi. Okay? So the firm is blind to what happens in operation. Okay. Um, turns out that if you know the average, you know the sorry, the, you can express the average price like this. You know these quantities. Uh, you can express the short run profits for the firm like this. Okay, basically you can rewrite it. Um, th these are the short run profits for the firm. Basically, that's that's the payment. Sorry, before you divide by x, these are the profits for the firm. They're gonna get for, but the the regulators are gonna pay them per unit of capacity. So you have to divide by x. Okay, so that's the payment for the firm. Okay, the only problem here is that this payment comes from the market. So the firm here, we're assuming, is price taker with respect to this. Like the firm doesn't know what's the rule, just puts the capacity on the table and there's a payment back. Like the, the firm doesn't try to be strategic about what the regulator is doing. We're gonna see that in a few more slides. Like, no strategic behavior. Okay, so, um, this is the pricing rule, basically. The, uh, the, the regulator is going to pay you this, basically, if you invest in something. And if you invest in nothing, it's going to pay you zero, of course. OK? So now, it's like we have this, this problem, the investment problem. You get the price, uh, the, the price and it's, instead of having like a market clearing condition, I have this constraint that says that variable comes from this. So now you write the KKT conditions and you have two unknowns, pi and x. And you have two constraints, this one and that one. Hmm? And it should be two times pi and x? Yeah, it, it's except that i is 4. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's i. Yeah, it's fine. OK? If you solve this, you get that the optimal investment level in this case is 7.8, and the average price is 146.8. So, deregulated prices. If the prices are, if the market is completely deregulated, sorry, this. optimal investment is 13, price one, 140, price two, 28. If there is a price cap, optimal investment 1.4. Press one at the price cap, price two, 74, 4, 4. If the regulator says now that we're going to use average pricing, optimal investment is 7.8, average price 146.4. Okay. So depending on the administrative rule you have, uh, firms are going to change their investment strategy. Okay. So you can use these models to uh, quantify basically what's the impact of these administrative rules. Welfare, happiness. It turns out now uh, uh, this rule distorts market the, the market, but in this case the distortion is not that big. It's only two point. You, you have a two point seven, two point six percent loss on welfare. Anyone has an insight of why the loss is not that big in this case? Because fall is very. Mm, could be. That there's something else about the prices. Why do you think that this doesn't distort things that much? It, distort, it, dist, it distorted, but not too much. What's average pricing doing? So the optimal prices are this one, right? And now I'm going to give you the average. It's not the average of these two numbers. It's the average of the endogenous right? price. But think about this too. It's like I'm going to pay you the average. So if I'm going to pay you the average in the period one, I'm going to hurt you or give you more money than you deserve. And in period one, I'm going to pay you more or less than what you deserve. Less. less. In period one, it's high demand, right? So in period one, uh, you're going to be unhappy, right? I should have paid you more, but I pay you less. But in period two, I'm going to pay you more than what you deserve. It kind of averages out, right? That's why in this example, 
it's, it creates a distortion, but it's not too big. What do you think that will happen if, to this example, we add a storage unit that is arbitrary energy between period one and two, and we say, oh, we're going to use average pricing. Do you think there will be a distortion there? You're a storage owner, so your, your, your money comes from charging cheap energy and selling more expensive energy. Do you think there's going to be a distortion? It's, it's, instead of giving you the two prices, I give you one price. What's, are there going to be incentives for the storage unit to enter the market? Or not? No, the, the owner of the storage unit lives off price differences. If you don't give the owner price differences, there's no business. Right? So it depends on what you're analyzing. In this case, there's not much of a distortion, but if you change the example, there could be a big distortion. Okay, that was just an illustration. Now let's make, let's look at to an apply example. So this is an analysis we did with uh, a former student we have, Gabriel um, Rodrigo Moreno from Universidad de Chile, on a carbon tax that the Chilean government imposed very recently. So uh, the government said, okay, we're gonna enforce a carbon tax. This is our tentative uh, schedule to increase the tax over time. We're gonna start with a very low value, $5 per ton, and then we're gonna increase it up to, I don't know, 30 by 20, 46. It's, it's, it's a plan, it's not written at all. But right now we have a tax of $5 per ton. And we were the first ones in South America doing this. And of course, by being the first one, uh, we got a lot of attention from international agencies. The, the International Energy Agency wrote a report that said, look, Chile is doing the right thing, and the IEA applauds this. So, congratulations. There's this recent book by uh, many big names are there, and so on, Peter Cranton, Stephen Stuff, where they talk about the importance of global carbon pricing, a couple of Nobel Prizes in economics here too, where they also cite Chile, they say, look, Chile is the other section in the world of a country that's doing the right thing. The only problem is that they didn't look at the fine print of, of, of the carbon tax. Okay? One interesting thing is that I think we were the first country in the world implementing a carbon tax that uses a cost-based market and not a bid-based market. In a bid-based market, uh, the regulator imposes uh, some regulation and then it's the problem of the firms to whether to include that or not on their bids. In a cost-based market, any regulation like a carbon tax needs, need, needs to have some uh, companion document to say how are those costs gonna be included in the dispatch. And that's the problem in Chile. Okay? And there's evidence that in bid-based markets, firm include all of those costs, all of those opportunity costs on their bids. Like if, you, if, if a coal power plant is facing, you know, like a $20 carbon charge, uh, economists have measured that they adjust their bid by $20 upwards, not, not a different number. So they include what they should include. They do what the models predict their bid. <coughs> What's the problem? So in Chile, the carbon tax has two unique features. First feature, there's a pass-through restriction. Basically, the government said, look, we're going to implement the carbon tax but we don't want to change the economic dispatch of the system. Weird, right? Um, so that means that we operate the system as if the carbon tax doesn't exist, and at the end of the year, in December, the regulator looks back and counts emissions and sends a bill to all the power plants saying, look, you emitted all of this, you have to pay for this. Okay? That means that the dispatch is confiscatory because there are hours when firms cannot cover their, their short-term costs, right? And obviously, the carbon tax doesn't reduce emissions in the short term because by definition, it's not included in this, okay? So first big mistake. Second problem, there, are, there is a side payment rule that says if, if, you are, if you are losing money in an hour, all of those losses, say this is the spot price, computed this without, without the carbon tax. All the losses, we're gonna sum them, all the losses, and then we're gonna prorate them among all units. All running units are gonna pay for the losses of the generators that are, that are not covering their costs. 
what's the implication of that? Is that, for example, say, in this hour we have these units running, and the only unit that is facing a carbon tax is the coal. That unit is setting the price here, because the tax is not considered for setting the price. But it's, and so it's losing all this money in that hour. The regulations say that all these losses are prorated among this unit, that unit, that unit, and that unit. So that means that, for example, if you own a solar power plant, you pay some of the carbon tax that is faced by a coal unit. Okay, so hard to justify this. We don't know why they did this this way. Like, there's no official like report that say, hey, we did it this way because of this. No, but um, we talked to some people and they say it was like a political constraint, basically. We want a carbon tax, but if we include it in the dispatch, prices are going to go up in the short term. Uh, people are not going to like it, and we want firms that pay for the carbon tax, not people. So we're going to face firms to do this, and it's unfair that only some firms firms face the losses. So we socialize the losses among all firms. That's that's the uh, informal explanation we got. Okay. Okay, so we were curious and we were like, okay, this is obviously wrong. Okay, you don't, you don't need a model to know that this is wrong. But our question was, how wrong is this? Like, how, what distortions this causes? In the short term, there is nothing to model. It's, it's almost boring to analyze because it doesn't change the dispatch. You just run your optimal dispatch for a year and that's your answer. That's what can happen. Okay? The, the real question is what happens in the long term? How this distorts the market in the long term. Okay? Okay, so we come up with two models. One that uh, emulates the Chilean market. The other one is a standard carbon tax, how you should do it. Let the carbon tax be included in the dispatch. And we assume all the nice things, perfectly competitive market, investments are continuous, etc., etc. So that means that this model, the two, the second one, you can solve it like as a central plan, easy. Central planning, tricky. Okay, so here's the interesting model, the first one, the one that emulates the Chilean market. So what we did? We have the problem of the system operator that dispatches the unit, ignoring the carbon tax. So minimizes the operation, the operating cost, subject to whatever capacities are available. I'm not going to go into the details here. Um, it turns out that if you're a unit, uh, using the previous example as an inspiration for this, say you invested in X unit of capacity of one technology here. Um, the the operator is going to take over your power plant, it's going to run the thing, and then it's like, going to give you a payment at the end. And you can interpret that payment, so, like if you add up all the prices times the quantities, and you play a little bit with the dual variables, you can find that you can write all these payments as uh, X, your investment variable, times something, like a payment that comes from the market. So you are not thinking about spot prices times what your times operating decision. You're thinking, I invested this many megawatts, I get one payment per year. You, you move the problem to a different space, basically. So now the operator is the only agent that looks at operations. Investors don't see operations. You have a second agent that is the regulator that gets a dispatch variables knows uh, the carbon emissions of every unit, the prices, and uses this uh, administrative rule to give each, each unit a uh, carbon charge. And that carbon charge is like an annual charge, okay? And using the same trick we used before, is a carbon charge per unit of capacity. So at the end of the year, the system operator tells you, you make all this money in the market, and then the regulator said, and you owe me all this money for carbon charge. And that's what, they, what, that's what firms see. They invest in X. Okay, this is their investment variable. They get paid theta for, from operations. They get charged the carbon charges, and they have to pay for the investment. And that's it. Okay, so we took all the, the operation variables out of the firm's problem. And we gave that to a different agent. Okay? The trick here is that that variable, 
it's endogenous, it's a price that comes out of, of the market. And that variable, the carbon charges, are also endogenous. Depends on who is emitting, what's going on. It's not like you can know ex ante what's going to be this. The only, the only parameter here is that, how much it costs you to invest. That's it. But everything else is variable, variable, variable. Okay? Well, it turns out that um, if you assume that those carbon charges are fixed, like if they're parameters, if this is a parameter, you can collapse this whole problem into a central planning problem that just minimizes investments plus operating costs, like trivial. If that is a parameter, but it's not, right? It's not a parameter. It comes out of the market. So what we did is we use this approach proposed by Greenberg and Murphy where they say, you know, when you have something endogenous like this, you can do like gauss the iterations, like find out what's the equilibrium of this market with that fix, and once you know the outcome of this, you compute the carbon charges, debate again, you update that, and then you solve again. If you converge, you can show that that's a KKT point, that's an equilibrium point, and that's the actual problem that you want to solve. That's how we found it, okay? Uh, does this converge? Yeah, sometimes if the function is nice, uh, but in this case, it's not. Okay, and there were some, some tax ranges where this didn't converge. It doesn't have to converge because the administrative function here, it's a, it's a black box. It's like what the regulator came up with. It doesn't, have, it, it doesn't need to have nice properties. It might be a complicated function full of if this, do this, else, do that. There's no guarantee that this is going to converge. So you're lucky if this, if this gets you somewhere, but it might not. Okay? And then we have the standard carbon tax. As I said, the standard carbon tax, central planning, and now, and here the, 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 the emissions are taxed the right way. So here, it's the operating cost of the machine, the marginal cost, plus the emissions times the tax. And this shows up in prices immediately. Right? And the, it changes the dispatch. Okay, and this model gives you the efficient solution. That's the right thing to do. Okay, so these are the right investment, this is the right dispatch, and this is going to give us their optimal emissions. There's no way you can improve upon this. So the other one is going to deviate from this. So here are some results. The blue lines show um, what, what the Chilean tax does, and the orange ones is, is the standard tax, like our benchmark, the optimal one. So up here we have thermal capacity as a function of different tax levels, and renewable capacity as a function of different tax levels. So for example here, if I increase the tax, uh, if tax is zero, I get the same result, right? There's, there's no carbon tax. So both models give the same result. But as, if, as I start increasing the carbon tax, uh, what you will expect from a good carbon tax is that you will offset investments in thermal, thermal technologies and have more investments in renewables. That's like what you would expect. Both do that. Both do that thing. They both move investments in, in that direction, the, one, the direction you expect. The problem is that the magnitudes are different, okay? Uh, a carbon, uh, the Chilean tax offsets some investments in capacity, thermal capacity, but uh, the standard tax is, uh, reduces investment much more. Obviously, this plot, this uh, axis is, doesn't start from zero, okay? But here's where you see big differences in renewable capacity, okay? With, with the, Standard tax, you get like 250% more investments in renewable generation capacity. Uh, what happens to emissions, which is why we implement the, the tax. That's the whole point of the tax, reducing emissions. So these are emissions as I increase the carbon tax. So with the Chilean tax, with these administrative restrictions, I increase the tax and reduce uh, emissions go down. Okay, so it reduces carbon emissions. But if we had a standard tax, carbon emissions would be much, much lower. Okay, so for a, for a $30 tax, which I believe we're gonna get there and probably go way beyond that, um, a standard tax uh, gets you 61% less emissions than the Chilean tax, just because we have these administrative rules. Then we ask the question, okay, uh, say I grab a point here. So, for example, this one. I, so we ask the question: What would it take us? What tax would we need to achieve 
what standard tax we need to achieve those same emissions that the Chilean tax will give us. So for example, for a tax rate of 30 here, those levels, those carbon emissions, we could achieve those same carbon emissions with that standard tax of 3.79. It's like with one tenth of the tax, we could achieve the same level of carbon emission. So it's extremely inefficient. Okay? Then we ask the question of, well, what happens to prices? Because some people say, well, okay, it's not that efficient. But at least the Chilean tax protects people because prices are not increasing. So firms are paying for this. We're like, eh, we're not sure about that. Let's look at prices. What are long-term prices? These are the prices that cover all costs. Not just the spot prices, it's everything, okay? So it turns out that as we increase the tax, both prices increase, okay? And um, there is a point where actually the Chilean tax achieves higher electricity prices than the standard tax. So maybe that statement that it protects customer might be a little bit true down here, but as we increase the tax, no, you're not protecting customers. Actually, you have less emissions, sorry, more emissions, and it's more expensive. And, and this was a very controversial picture when we showed it to the regulator. What happens with tax revenues, which is what the government is collecting from this? With the Chilean tax, you increase the tax, and tax revenues just keep increasing, like linear. If you're short of money, this, this is pretty good. Right? With the standard tax, you start increasing the tax, and eventually, there's a point where this like flattens out. Do you know why this happened here? Any insight why why with the standard tax like some at some point this thing like flattens out? How far ahead are you looking? Just one year. Like as one year investment, that's it. Annualized investment. It's a it's like a toy problem. You're almost not investing in the world. In carbon emitting yes, so they don't get what the yeah, what the government collects is tax times emissions, uh, annual emissions. So if you keep increasing the tax, for this to stay constant, then emission has to be going down pretty fast, right? And yeah, that's what happened, right? Like here. So you increase the tax, but then emissions go down pretty fast. So then you, your revenues are not that much. Right? They, they kind of like stabilize. And that's what how it should be done, right? But this is it's better for if, a government that needs money. Uh, right. So our problem, right, is that there are very weak incentives for the regulator to migrate to right? It's going to collect less money. So perspectives. Administrative pricing and operation rules exist, and they are, they can be important. Okay, and with these equilibrium models, you can. You can assess what's the effect of these this administrative rules. On paper, the first best marginal cost pricing always wins. That's always the best for, for the model, right? Uh, but in practice, you might not be able to implement that. With this type of model, you can assess, well, how, what, it, what does it cost you to, to do a second best, okay? In practice, Decision makers weigh the economic gains of removing the administrative pricing rules against the political or social cost of doing so. Okay, so maybe you're protecting customers, and then you say, okay, let's do the right thing. And then you have, you know, like a strike like this, and then it's too costly politically, you can't do it. That's real, not the model. Okay? So for example, in Chile at some point, uh, back in like 2011, uh, the Chilean Minister of Energy said, okay, um, people that live in Patagonia in the south have, ha has, have had subsidized gas for many decades, uh, and not the rest of Chileans. The party is over. That, those were his last few words. <laughs> That's, and, the, and the party was over, actually, <laughs> for him as well. <laughs> right? <laughs> for the party was over, actually. So he was doing the right thing. Actually, I've been to Patagonia many times, and one of the annoying things is that you go, you go to the house of someone that lives in like Punta Arenas, way, way south, and they keep the heating on 
all year, even in the summer. And when they are too hot, they open the doors in the winter. <laughs> <laughs> that's hot. And you're like, what are you doing? Why, do you, why don't you just turn that off? Oh no, that's all, all year. It's very cheap. So he was doing the right thing, but politically it wasn't possible to do. So keep in mind that. All right. And this is, these are my last slides. Um, Multi-level games, okay? So, um, we've been talking about these simultaneous games. We have the definition of Nash equilibrium. Uh, but here we're assuming that all players basically play exactly at the same time, okay? Uh, but that might not be very realistic in some settings. Okay, sometimes what some players kind of like know how the others are going to play, or one player is going to play before the other one. And in those cases, that definition doesn't really work very well. And you need something else, okay? So here's an example. I call it a monopoly game. This is, I came up with this because I started teaching economics and industrial organization courses. And they never mention multi-level games. They just say, here's the example of a monopoly. This is a Cournot. This is a stack I was like, that comes from like multiple level of playing, but you're never explaining that. But I was like, okay, let, let's, let's explain this the right way. So say there is a single firm in the market that must choose a production level Q at a price P. So that's the objective function. This is the first order condition of that firm. Okay? And there is a group of consumers that must choose a production level D given a price P. And believe me that this is the objective function of produce, of consumers. This is their happiness from consuming, and this is what they pay from, for consuming. They pay P, and this is what they get, okay? And that's the first order condition. Anyone that had, are there anyone, is there anyone here that, with a background in economics? No? Okay, you, okay. Here's the demand function, here. Here's a demand function. If you, if you put price on this side, and here's an equality, this says price equal to 100 minus 2 times D. That's a downward sloping demand function. Okay? So, this is in, in many economic courses, like exercises start with this sentence. There is a group of consumers with this demand function. Do this. Okay? But they don't really tell you, uh, wait, that came from here. Okay, there was a decision maker and the KKT condition that gets you to that demand function. Okay? If you solve this for a price taker monopolist, I mean, it's actually not a monopolist, just a single firm that is price taker, uh, you get this solution. This is the efficient solution. So there's no market power here, price is 50, uh, production quantity is 25. Okay, so say now that that firm is actually pretty, pretty clever and knows that it's going to face a group of consumers that have this KKT. Okay, so now I have the same monopolist, except that now the monopolist is going to choose a production level, knowing that down here consumers are going to choose a demand level solving this problem. It's like I take this problem and I put it. As, as, a, like as a constraint here. Okay, so now these guys know how this guy is going to behave. Okay, so they have like two optimization problems, one inside of another. Okay, and I have this market clearing constraint that demand has to be equal to supply, and the demand is going to be the solution of this optimization problem. Okay, the solution of this optimization problem can be written as a KKT with the KKT condition, right? So that problem, this, is equivalent to saying this. Demand perpendicular to this. It's the same. First order condition. Okay? Okay, now we're that problem, we can give that problem to Sigma. Sigma is gonna say, I don't know what you're talking about. Okay? I just do simple simple optimization problem. I don't know what is this. You can turn that into a complementarity constraint. There are some solvers that know how to deal with that. Okay, but this is still ugly, nasty. Like, what is that? This is weird. Okay, but then if you make the assumption, I mean, first of all, you know that demand is equal to supply. So you can reduce, reduce the number of variables from here and make, make that constraint disappear. 
And now you have only Qs instead of D. And then if you, you have this, if you make the assumption that you have an interior solution that Q is strictly greater than zero, then you can get rid of that, and this is an equality constraint. And then we're in, in, in the world that we know how to deal with. Right? And then we have the monopolist that is solving this subject to knowing what's the demand curve this. Okay? And once again, you have an equality constraint. You have two variables, price and quantity, but you can find the price from this. <coughs> you can replace the price with this equation. And here you have the problem of the monopolist with a single variable. Everything that I did here, it's something that in an economic class is not explained. They, they, they sort of tell you, given a monopolist, done, this. They skip all the, the previous step. They say, the monopolist that know the demand, the demand curve. So you go and replace price equals to something in function of quantity, you replace it here. And you solve this problem, and you find that the monopolist wants to produce less at a higher price, right? But the, one, the point I want to make is that this standard example from an economic score comes from actually a multi-level game. It's just that they skip this, this story here that said, where does the demand curve come from? It's actually another optimization problem. They never tell you. It's just that it's very easy to solve. Right? I don't know if that's clear. Yeah? OK, so the monopolist doesn't act as a price-taking firm and withholds capacity setting the price above its marginal cost. Okay, and as I wrote here, if you take any, if you look at any book from microeconomics on industrial organization, they're going to tell you there is a monopolist with a cost function q squared facing a linear demand that is that find the equilibrium price quantity and profit, and then that's the objective function you solve it, but you missed all the intuition from where does that come from? You just say okay, I'll do. Okay, it's actually a bi-level problem. Bi problem. Okay, I could not gain. Uh, a variation of the previous example. Now there are two firms instead of one. There are two firms that make um, production decisions and they know what's the demand again. Instead of one, there are two. And these two firms make decisions simultaneously following uh, and demand follows those decisions. Okay? And I use the same trick as before. This is hard to deal with. This is hard to deal with. I know the KKTs. I replace this with the KKTs, and eventually I, got, I get rid of the demand variables and the price variables, and I get to that, which is just taking the demand curve and replacing it here. Okay, and here I have what's called a Cournot game. It's kind of like monopoly, but with n greater than one. Okay, more than more than two play, more than one player. So now there are two firms that know that if they withhold a little bit of production, the price is going to go up. Okay, and if I solve this, I get uh, these levels of production. I solve in parallel the model with perfect competition, and I get that. So there's market power. The price here is higher. They produce less. It's not meant to be uh, an economics course, but I just want to show you how you can get to those standard games from microeconomics using this. And the third one, the Stackelberg game. They always say this is the game where there is a leader and then there is a follower. So here we assume that there, one of the two firms uh, moves first. The standard example for this is, okay, say there is a, an incumbent firm that has been in the market forever, that knows very well the market. And then there is a new firm that just started, it's also going to produce. It's, it's kind of unreal to believe that they're both going to make a simultaneous move. The firm that is already installed probably knows a lot about the market. It probably knows exactly how the other firm is going to react to something. So here you have a three-level game. Firm one makes choices knowing how firm two is going to make choices. And they both know how demand is going to react to this. OK, we have the market clearing conditions here. And again, we use the same trick. Replace the KKT conditions and get rid of things. and then we. We keep moving up, up, and up. Come on, this is kind of like dynamic programming. Like you start solving from the end and work your way backwards. Right? Okay. Um, same thing. Okay, closed form solution for the problem of consumers. Then you have a problem. At, you go from three levels to two levels. 
And once you have two levels, solving the lower level is easy. And then you replace the information from the lower level and you give that to the first level. And then you just have one variable. And once you have that one variable, you once you, want, you, once you know what is the optimal Q1, you replace that here, and you know what's the optimal Q2. And once you know Q1 and Q2, you know what's the demand, etc. Et so here's a summary of what I did, the summary of examples. OK, perfect competition with one firm. That's assuming that the firm and the consumers move, make choices at the same time, simultaneously. This is the production quantity, this is the price. Then I have a monopolist. So a firm knows that how consumers are going to react. This is the optimal production quantity, much less than before. Price is higher. Then I have a second firm, and I start saying, OK, there is perfect competition. OK, that's according to saying firm one, firm two, and consumers all move at the same time. That's the result. Then I say, OK, let's change that. Now let's assume that the firms choose first and they know how consumers are going to react. That's, that has a name called the court number. And then let's change that. Now assume, let's assume that the firm one is going to move first, followed by firm two, and consumers are going to follow firm two. That has a name. It's called a stack of game. Okay, and all these assumptions change the results, depending on who moves first. Okay? So, for example, here's an interesting fact. Uh, could not, of course, worse than perfect competition, right? I'm just looking at the price. Prices are higher. There's market power. But if, if firm one moves before firm two, this is a little bit better. Okay, if there's one strategic firm, uh, there's still market power. We're not there. But this is a little bit closer to 33 than 50. Any insight why if one agent is moved first, you get a little bit closer to the competitive outcome? No? They are producing much more. They are producing more so they gain more even though they have a bit less revenue for you. Uh, well, what happens is that firm one takes over more of the profits and it sort of like saturates the market and then firm two enters and like accommodates does whatever it can, given that the other firm, you know, saturated the market. Um, the outcome, the, in the aggregate outcome is more competitive, but in terms of profits for firms, here, firm one is happier here than here. Yeah? Okay. So, uh, moral of the story, you can derive all of those famous gains from microeconomics or industrial organization, assuming this hierarchical level of competition, all of them, including monopoly. Uh, different names for these types of games, not necessarily could not stack over. Mathematical problem with equilibrium constraints. Equilibrium problem with equilibrium constraints. Closed loop games. They don't mean exactly the same, but they all point at, at the, in the same direction. Okay, games where someone chooses first and someone else follows, or or maybe two choose first and then two follow, etc. Et okay? Same same thing. Okay, application. Could not meet the real world. Um, because these are games, toys. Okay, these are uh, abstractions of reality. Is there any empirical evidence that, for example, this setup has anything to do with how firms actually make decisions. So um, Jim Bushnell and a couple of colleagues from uh, Berkeley asked this question and they look at bid-based markets in the US where firms kind of just bid things. And they say, well, can we approximate the outcome of the market using a Cournot model? And they look at data from 1999. So they had the data, they, they, know, they knew what happened. So they had the outcome prices. So they were trying to see if with a Cournot model they could replicate those prices. So, okay, they, they use publicly available data about uh, firm costs. Uh, this plot shows prices as a function of demand, but it's uh, demand divided by the maximum demand. So it goes from zero to one. 
Okay? So the points here, the, the dots you see here, are, those are the actual price. That's what actually happened in the market. Um, the black line is the average of that cloud of points. It's the actual price curve. So the black line is reality. Okay, that there's no model, that, that just could happen. The dashed line is uh, running a competitive model. So using publicly available data, they run, run a competitive model, assuming price taking firms, and they got these prices. And as you can see here, they are pretty close most of the hours to what actually happened, okay? Except here, okay? When, when demand is high. And on, in parallel, they run a Cournot model. And, then, and that's what the Cournot model predicted. So the mo Cournot model predicted that this will be the prices that happen in the market, but this is what actually happened. So the, the Cournot model was uh, exaggerating market power. So if a regulator would look at this, then like assessing, oh, should we implement a bid-based market? You would run a Cournot model and be like, hell no. Like, where? No, we don't want this. We want this. We're not going to implement the bid-based market. No way. So then they say, OK, but there is something we didn't consider here. Actually, many firms have long-term contracts. They have power purchase agreements. And it turns out if you have a power purchase agreement, <coughs> If you raise the price, it's not very convenient for you because you have to pay the customer the difference between the agreed price and the spot price. So if you do consider that, then the output would be very different. So then they consider the, the contracts and they adjusted the Cournot model, they added the term Cournot model plus contracts. And that's what happened. Okay, now the gray, the, the gray line it's closer to the actual outcomes here. And actually, it's pretty close. Okay? So they published this in the American Economic Review, pre pretty, pretty respectable journal in economics. And basically, their conclusion was, you know, these tolling models can be pretty good if you use them carefully. Like if you consider the things you should consider, they point in the, in the right direction. And the second, the second um, conclusion was contracts make a huge difference in market outcomes. Gigantic difference. If you don't consider contracts, that's the world you're going to be looking at. When this is the actual. Is there market power? Yeah, there's still market power. There, there is a difference here, right? But it's not as bad as that gray line predicted. Okay? So, very good to keep that into consideration. Here's the PGM market. Well, the previous one was ISO New England. Here's PGM. Okay, this is what happened, and this is what the Cournot model predict. The Cournot model said, oh, no, your market is too concentrated. If you do this, bam, you're gonna hit the price cap almost all the time. The market is gonna explode. <coughs> but that's not what happened. And then they considered the contracts, and the market models are pretty close to what actually happened. Is there market power? Yeah, there's still market power. But it's not that. Okay, so the magnitude is completely different. You have to use these models very carefully. We asked uh, a similar question in Chile. In Chile, we have a cost based market, and we're thinking about switching out to a bid based. And when I talked to people, when I came back to Chile, I went back to Chile, sorry. Uh, uh, a lot of people say, no, no way, we can't switch to uh, bid base because our market is too concentrated. And with a cost based market, the outcome is always better because the cost based market mitigates all market power. You can't win that. A cost based market. And I say, mm, I'm not sure about that. I said, let's, let's see, let's, let's set up a simple toy mode. Say we have two load periods. We have two firms, it's just an illustration example. So I set up a central planner, okay, that gives me the efficient <laughs> outcome. Then I set up a bid based market, which is kind of like a Cournot model, except that it's two levels. So firms invest first, and then they know that they're gonna face a bid based market down here, where they might be able to exercise market power here too. And here's the cost based market. 
So here firms invest knowing that they're going to face a cost-based market, that the regulator is going to say, your price is going to be the marginal cost. You, you cannot bid. Let's see what happens. So here we have investments per firm in the cost-based market, the business market, and the central planner. Of course, the central planner, this is the most efficient one, total welfare, the maximum. The central planner will choose 9,000, sorry, 900 megawatts in terms of investment. In the base-based market, you get 600, and in the cost-based market, you get 500. Total welfare, highest here, but the order here is not what we expect. Actually, the bid based market is better than the cost based market. Not by much, but as uh, Schmuel says, one counter example disproves a theory. So your theory doesn't work here. Okay, maybe the difference is not very big, but you can't say this is always better than this because I can just come up, come up with a simple example and show you that that's not true, necessarily. It might be true in some cases. Okay, actually, we play a little bit with the parameters, and we found that for some parameters, this flips. Sometimes the cost-based market, sometimes this is better, sometimes this is better. So you can't just assume that's like a, a general true, right? What's the, what's the sorry, the, the, the main conclusion of this is, it depends on the market. <laughs> that's when you are adding the, the dimension of investment yes. in this. Yes, investments. Yeah. Otherwise, if you're not adding investments, then you're always going to conclude that this is better than this one. Obviously. Yeah. And here's the, the a, a deeper problem. Prices are huge in there. Right. Because investments are very different. Well, uh, it's much more. I, I don't know. Hmm? That's like the one quarter difference of the price of the peak prices and there's like 50% more investment, so yep. surprising. Yeah, surprising. I want to insist that this is a toy model. Right. It's just to build intuition, that's it. In reality, comparing this is much more complicated because in a cost-based market, I mean, you're, you're forgetting the information dimension. That here I'm assuming that I have perfect information in all this model. In practice, the main problem of comparing these two guys is that in a cost-based market, you tell the firms, Tell me the truth, or I will, I will kill you. Just tell me the truth. Maybe you will get the truth, maybe you won't. Who knows? And here in the bid-based market, you say, well, I, I have put the incentive, so you report your true cost through your bid, and I'm relying on a, ma on a mechanism for you to report to do that. And reporting your cost is not just reporting how much, what are your fuel costs, it's like your opportunity costs too. For example, yes. if you have, you know, a gas turbine with intertemporal constraints. Maybe you want to start later and not now. There's an opportunity cost of that. Yes. Auditing that, it's very hard. It's extremely hard. Uh, preferences, etc. So this is just a toy comparison. It, the actual comparison, it's much, much harder. Okay? But it just makes a point. But as you said, since it's true, uh, bring intuition, how do you face the price differences between both in your toy game? Like the peak and off peak, yes. Price difference. What feeling do you get out of it? Um, these, these results. Like, why is the cost base facing a bigger peak price than the base base? Through the very term or no? Yeah. In in the cost base market, these guys have incentives since they know that they are not going to be able to raise their bids in the cost base market. Yes. The only tool to make prices go up is to create scarcity. To say okay, I cannot raise prices here in the cost-based market because you're going to are not in, when demand is low probably the constraints are not going to be active so there's nothing I can do there but in the peak, the demand hour I can withhold capacity and make constraints become active and when constraints become active, boom, prices go up in the, in the bid-based market it's different because uh, you don't need a constraint to become active to prices to raise because you, you can bid. Yes. So it's almost like you here, you concentrate the market power here because that's the only point where you can do exercises. But here you exercise it in both periods. But you, you could say that whenever you try to force people to go to the competitive enough, mm -hmm. 
artificial way, they would figure out another way to play that game. Exactly. And at least the only thing that they can do now is to invest less. Mm -hmm. So that see that it will be under buying. the low cost one. Yes. Yes. That and we yes. We talk about this with Frank Wallach. He has he he said yeah, the problem they he said the problem we have in the, the California is that most pe most people only think about market power in terms of bidding. Like like you bid differently, and that's market power, or you lie about rapid limits, and that's market power. But there's a whole other dimension of market power. I can delay the entrance of a planet, you know, skyrocket prices. That's also market power. It's just much harder to monitor and control. Okay. Let me think. You know, on, on the uh, on the cost-based market, you must assume that you have perfect information. Here we you assume that you, you you don't need that assumption on the bid-based market. On the bid-based market, you don't need that assumption. You, it's you're you you're you're relying on the market. Okay. I think to show you yes, it's like an auction. Like yeah, if you yeah, lie, I know, I know it. well, you might it might be your loss. Okay. But, but, but on the cost basis, you must assume that you have perfect information right. to have this result. But on the big basis yes. market, you don't need that assumption to have this exactly the yes. same result. And, and even with even with that that uh, symmetry of of, 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 of of assumptions, you have a better result with the big basis. Yes. Exactly. Also, I mean, I mean, as, as I, the there's a, a dimension that is missing here. That is the information. So yes. to be to be fair, the actual comparison you want to make is say, here I have the perfectly competitive market with perfect information. That's where we want to get. But we don't know how to. And we have imperfect options down here. One imperfect option is a cost-based market, where firms can exercise market power through investments, and where the information that goes into the software might be wrong. Even if I audit, it's almost impossible to audit everything. So it's it's not a perfectly competitive market, it's something else. And on the side we have a bid-based market where I rely on, on the market mechanisms for, for, for firms to, to show the information, but sometimes they might not do it, they might lie, because they, they, they could exercise market power. It's not obvious what's the ranking between the two down here, not obvious. You could probably say that or no, if you're in a country where there are two firms, two firms and just two generation units, I don't know, maybe it will be too risky to implement a bid based market. Maybe you just say, okay, I'm not just not gonna, I don't wanna get a headache, just, let's just do cost based market. But as the market starts growing, eh, I don't know, I have a feeling that eventually there's certain sites where, you, where you're audit, auditing things that you could just rely on a market mechanism to be recorded. Because you have to be sincere with yourself and know that you are using a mechanism that is imperfect, that you can audit everything. And a lot of ISOs really don't see that. Like, uh, they believe that they believe that comparing a cost-based market with a bid-based market is just comparing this with the gray curve. So they say, if you are in a cost-based market, why would I want to go to a Cournot model? Obviously, it's always worse. I don't want it. But that's the wrong comparison. That's like just how things might go bad. But you need to s compare how things might improve to. Like, for example, information. So you need to do, this is a cost-benefit analysis here for in one dimension, but you need all the other dimensions. And only then you can say, okay, we should do this. But just from looking at this, you're just comparing all the terrible things that could happen in a big market, but none of the good things. <coughs> okay? And maybe that comparison is actually pretty hard. You're going to end up making that decision based on, you know, like a big assumption. And also the word competitive practical cost is a is a strange word because some ISOs don't even how to do costs. They, they just rely on yeah, so, so for example, in at California SO or PGM, they still have some safe mechanism to control bits that get out of, get out of the, like a range, right? So it's, it's say they say, okay, 
Uh, in this hour, you're behind a transmission constraint, and, and we know that you can destroy the market if you want. Okay, in this hour, I'm just going to use some previous bid from you, plus minus 10% of something, and I'm going to use that administrative <coughs> bid. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to let you bid. I'm going to make a mistake, but only in that hour. But in the rest of the hours, it's bid. But I'm saying that for example, you in Brazil, we have this audited cost. Yeah. But the I the coordinator doesn't go to each firm and make calculations for all of them. <laughs> Just rely on maybe there is if there is some huge right. we go there and check. Yeah. So maybe you, you have like an endogenous big based market, it's just that you don't call it. Like maybe you should just make it transparent. <laughs> um, okay, and to finish, uh, it seems like all multi-level markets have some sort of like negative connotation. Like someone is doing something bad for someone else, like Kurno Monopoly, Stack Break. Uh, that's not necessarily true. You can do multi-level games for good. So for example, uh, transmission planning. You can do proactive transmission planning. Like uh, a transmission planner knows that generators are strategic and that they can, they can exercise market power. So now the transmission planner is not going to be naive and wait for the generators to uh, <coughs> request lines. It's the generation, the transmission planner is going to try to sort of like guide the market and say, I'm just going to put this line here because if I make this line available, I know that I'm going to give incentives for generators to build stuff there. And I know that's very good for the system. Okay? You can, you can set that up as a multi-level game where the transmission planner moves first with a good intention, like maximizing social welfare or minimizing cost. Then we have the firms that want to maximize profits. Then we have the market. And, uh, David Pozo and Enzo Samuel and me, we're all, we, we have all done different contributions to this and show that if, if you do proactive transmission planning, uh, your outcomes should be better than just waiting for a generator to request for that. Like you move first. Okay, so not all multi-level games are like bad or market, have market power. You can use market power strategic decisions for good. Many more possible yes, you like I I, love, I I I like a lot to talk about proactive transmission expansion. I would like to know your opinion in that sense. For example, when we are looking at the Brazilian planning agency, uh, we we look for example they are seeing where the hotspots for wind and solar, and they would, are willing for making the transmission to arrive there before ending a ten-year planning horizon, so that you have the enough transmission system for them to be competitive and be in the options. That's very good, but imagine in a place like Germany that you have a lot of renewable already installed, that imagine a place that you have the average capacity factor of the wind park all over the country the same. Imagine like that. And you don't know where, and you have, let's say, gas loads, whatever, spread out. So how would you do a, tra a proactive transmission planning? So which information do you need so, so that this layer can exist before generation decisions? Well, I think I'm going to try to answer your question indirectly. Um, you're familiar with stochastic programming, right? You know the value of the stochastic solution, right? The value of the stochastic solution is how, how much you improve your decision using a stochastic tool instead of some deterministic, right? Like the, using the average value of parameters. Here you can also compute what's the value of being a proactive planner. Okay, what's the difference between being reactive, like waiting for invest generation investment to occur, and then add the line versus going first? And it could be that that number or the system you mentioned is this big. Okay, it could be that for that system, maybe being proactive doesn't doesn't add you much value then don't bother with this. Like, but there are systems where that equivalent value of the stochastic solution is big and then okay, you should push the relator to go there. But if you have you know, a system where, I don't know, the, there are lots of available resources with similar qualities and the, the grid is very meshed, 
it's like if you don't plan now, you fix things later, it's not too different compared to like trying to do it before. Yes. So that's the way I think about it. I don't know if I answer your question. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so we're done. Final remarks from today. Market is just a tool that can be used to achieve an objective. Okay, don't pray to market. It's just a tool. That's it. And in general, many of the best functioning markets are have some central planning in there. Okay, it's not just markets. And the equilibrium models I show you here are very useful tools to address questions about what's the impact of introducing this rule or this feature or risk aversion. Okay? Um, so relevant features are this, like you know, physical constraints, not smooth price behavior, that's why our equilibrium models are very complicated. When an economist looks at our models, looks and says, whoa, why do you want to model a lot of those things? Because they matter, you know? Unlike toy, toy problems in economics. Environmental policies, new markets, uncertainty and risk aversion, importance of incomplete or complete markets, administrative restrictions, as I show you here, it's very important. They can deviate the market significantly. And strategic behavior, for the good or the bad. You know, like for proactive planning or for market power. Yeah. And just keep in mind that the purpose of these models is not to predict what's going to happen exactly in the market. It's to learn, to get insights about what are the effects of changing rules or, or, or changing a little thing. It's very unlikely that you're going to be able to predict with precision the outcome, you know, like a price. You're, remember that you're, we're here, we're modeling be, behavior, like decision makers, okay? Uh, we have many assumptions, so it's very unlikely that we will get an exact answer. So, the purpose of mathematical programming is insight, not numbers, okay? Um, so, programming doesn't replace thinking. Like, you still have to interpret this. And, and maybe you won't believe what you're seeing. You're saying, oh, this is too simplified. I don't believe it. It's, it's all open, so sort of like open to interpretation. And don't overcomplicate your models unless it's strictly necessary. Like a lot of people are starting this, say, okay, I need to model everything. All ramping limits, all unique limits, everything. That's the only way to make the model better. Not necessarily. If you want to address like one specific question, maybe you don't know that. Maybe just going to add complexity that you don't actually need it. And when someone says, I want to improve the models, improving the model doesn't necessarily mean adding unique commitment constraint. Maybe it means, maybe you have to consider risk aversion. Maybe that means improving the model. Okay? It's not necessarily improving the engineering representation of the model. Sometimes it means improving the, uh, how you model agents. Okay? okay, so that's it. Here's a long bibliography. In Thank you very much for your <laughs>
why they do it for many reasons for a little risk aversion and many other things but at the end of the day there is a thing here in brazil due to regulatory framework also they play a little bit because imagine you have a direct operating cost of 110 dollars per megawatt hour and the spot price now is 100. so if you're real operating cost is 90 here in brazil can call the operator to generate out of the merit order so they play with it just to win the spread but it's you're limiting their play. In the deep base, to our experience, when there are big horses that can make the things they are doing, then the deep base is not so good because they change so much the market. And that's very clear. It's very clear in many countries. So when you have big guys, these big guys do what they want. So big bases are not so good for these markets. Depending on uh, what's the fraction of contracts. Big guys have contracted 100%. Then uh, yeah, you're limiting their but That's not the case in some. Yeah. yeah. No, no, I know. Uh, for example, yeah. For, so in Chile, the, uh, there was a researcher in Chile who published a paper back in 2000, for example. That in Chile we were having the same discussion. Should we switch to a bid based market? And then uh, it was Soledad again. She she did an analysis and she said no. If we do it. This could not analysis. The things are going to go bad, and even like the only solution is if we have contracts. But right now, there are not that many contracts, so it's too risky. I think her answer and her recommendation was accurate. I think it was right in that moment. But for many years now, we have a mandate for contracts in Chile. You know, so like demand represents like 50% of load. Demand retail demand. 100% of that demand has to be contracted for like 15, 20 years. And the remaining firms, like copper mining, copper mines, etc., they all want a contract too. There's a very small fraction of agents that don't have contract. We're assessing that now. What, how, how does her recommendation changes from 2000 to 2019? So you have to take the system today, but now you say, look, there's like 60% of the man is, 70% of the man is contracted. If we switch to a bid based market, are things gonna explode or not? And if we take the contracts away, are things gonna explode or not? So I don't know, we're open to, we're gonna look into that. The other thing that it's kind of hard to put a number on that is that, for example, take the carbon tax for example again. The reason we have that is partly because we have a cost-based market. If we had a bid-based market, the cost of the carbon emission would be included in the bid. That's it, yes, that's right? So I think, I don't think by switching to a bid-based market, you're gonna see like much more efficient investment just because firms can report the cost better. I think it's just that we're gonna be able to fix many other things that we have to do because we have a cost-based market. For example, implement the Nadea head market. It's tricky when you have a cost-based market because the whole point of the Nadea head market is, it's, first of all, it's voluntary. Second of all, firms have to be allowed to bid. Like if you're a wind farm, you should be allowed to bid what you believe that you can deliver tomorrow. And if you can, tomorrow you have to buy at the spot price. But you suffer the consequences of that. If, if you don't want to commit to something tomorrow, well, it's up to you. But in a cost-based market, it's not that you can't do it, it's that you have to almost reinvent the wheel. Every time you want to do something, you have to, you can't use some standard solution from abroad. You have to invent something new. And I think that's where there is potential for improvement. Not because we're gonna see much more efficient investment, I believe, that's my opinion. Any questions? Any more questions? So, um, one, one of the... has a book of questions. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> I'll choose the best one. To my... So, uh, one of the main difficulties, I think, for planning and decision taking is that often it's very hard to measure that by a single number. And people have s talked a lot about multi-objective optimization and etc. And at the end of the day, what I have usually seen is that 
somehow people like find a way to transform that to a single number by choosing some weights or prices or parameters or whatever they call it. And it seems to me that this, in, in some sense, when you talk about risk aversion, it's probably something along this line. You're trying to capture the behavior about a probability distribution on a single number. And it's probably impossible to transform the whole complexity of your decision to a single number. And that's probably why agents don't behave in any of these models. Do you have any ideas either from equilibrium models or other things that come close to this multi-objective representation or Okay, so yeah, I think your, your comment is spot on. Um, well, first of all, yeah, there is, there is a whole theory of multi-objective optimization. My advisor has a book on multi-objective optimization applied to electric, electric power systems. So, yeah, there are rules on how you write KKTs and with weird things, and you end up with Pareto optimal things, etc. Um, with respect to risk aversion, I think it's a combination of risk aversion and then uh, in rationality. I think it has a, it's a mixture of those two. And I know that there are a lot of economists working on that right now. There's a thing that's called behavioral economics, um, prospect theory, where they are trying to come up with models where agents are not just maximizing some profit. It's like they're maximizing profit or something taking into account other factors. So for example, uh, uh, my neighbor shows this. So if my neighbor chose this, I'm much more li I'm like biased to follow that person, things like that. But that comes from psychology. And you can point out many articles where you can read about that. They're all models, of course. But yeah, there is theory in that. And there's a lot to do. I mean, we, I think there's a, a lot of opportunities for us researchers to try to grab that. And Include it here, include that here, somehow. Okay. I think that one of the, coming back to the, to the first question, uh, I think one of the good things of markets is that it, it puts the correct incentives for people to, to make more, uh, I, I don't know, to, to foster innovation, to create better opportunities that might not exist in the other the other uh, setup and one other interesting thing is it gives the correct responsibility it assigns the correct responsibility to the whenever you share the the, the effects the, the, the pros and cons of being efficient or not sometimes I went, okay it, it has the same with the students if I say that all of you we're gonna have the average of the marks that all of you in a test so the ones that want stuff I don't need to study there, the, the smart guys that will make the average higher. So the guys that has the higher average, they say, oh, come on, those guys won't study, so I won't study anymore. And suddenly we converge to zero. And this is quite true. This is happening all the time. So whenever you assign the responsibility, the, the mechanism of reallocation of energy is a precise example of this. You're running calls because we don't assign the responsibility for each other and we share everything. So of course it's a difficult problem. Anyone is saying that something is easy to solve with markets, but the responsibility is the first indicators of do your job, do it correctly, do the best, and at least we, you can play around with some market um, strategic bidding or something like this, but as Francisco is pointing now, we are full of contracts. We have full lot of incentives to do not pick the prices and put them crazy. Because otherwise we have like every generating company has like almost full contracted in terms of fiscal guarantee. So in, at the end, we just need to know how to manage this amount of contracts through the, the, the next years after we implement some kind of market because there are some examples for for example, that I think it was in the, the paper that he gave us to read that they said, okay, at the beginning, the Californian 
system was full of contracts and the market was fine. But after the contracts were running at the end, and they say, okay, now I'm free. I can manipulate the prices and no, part, no contracts anymore, no incentives. So we have to, to keep pushing them to, to go towards contracts, but also through market in some sense. I don't know how to do it in a correct uh, market incentive way, but yeah, I don't know. What is your view of how to manage this amount of contract in terms yeah. of incentive? Well, I think that if you want to have some, I mean, I hope that this is the message you got from this, not that market like magically solve all the problem. No, actually it can have many problems. It's just that you need to have the right set of tools to analyze them. And sometimes, and actually most time, you need you still not need some regulation or, or central control. Um, yeah, so um, from what's 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 the what's the moral of the story here? In, in all these markets what you say about California was a little bit wrong. What actually happened is that in California, the regulators saw that other markets around the world were being, becoming deregulated. This is not just switching to bid basis. It, they had like just monopolies, right? Big change. The, there were many problems. The first problem was that the regulators said, okay, firms, now we're gonna have a bid based market. Uh, well, first of all, we're gonna have a market and it's gonna be bid. Two things. Um, and the regulator said, hey, uh, uh, distribution firms, retailers, don't buy, don't buy contracts. Buy from the spot market because it's all going to be more efficient. The prices are going to be lower. They so don't. This. Yeah, the regulator said, don't sign contracts. <laughs> Bad deal. You'll be powered much cheaper from the spot market. Since there was no demand for contracts, there was no one to sell the contracts. So that's why there were no contracts. So when when the electricity market in California was set up, there were no contracts, okay? First problem, second problem, very important. The, the regulator had little, little idea how bid-based market worked. So most of the smart guys were working for the firms. And look at, watch that movie, the smartest guy in the room. They had the best mathematicians, economists, that knew all of this equilibrium modeling and knew exactly how to game the system. But the regulator didn't have anyone equivalent to like fight them back. So it was like the companies were owning the regulation, like the market. Um, and on top of that, they were not doing novel no pricing, so things were distorted, and so you could gain anything. Right after that, they impose regulations on contracts. Like now, there has to be a percentage of demand contracted, just like in Chile, by regulation. So, if you need to control market power, ideally you want market power to go away by more entry from competition. That's the, that's the best way to fight market power, more, with more competition. Unfortunately, there's little control with that for the regulator. What, what can the regulator do? remove entry barriers, make information transparent, invite people to invest, etc. But that's it. Okay? So then you still need some administrative action to control market power. One thing, you have market monitoring departments. You have these administrative pricing rules for times when you think that the market's not going to work out. You can impose firms that have to, uh, demand that has to be contracted. Okay, so those are all administrative actions that you can you can follow. Once demand is almost fully contracted, I believe that the job of the market monitoring, the market monitor is a lot less stressful because once you have contracts, you go from this to this. Okay? So what the the market monitor has to deal is not with this, but with this, trying to bring this down. Okay, so that the, the job of the market monitor becomes this stable. Okay, not all of this. So it's not like you can you will magically make things disappear, like market power. But it's a lot more help for the market monitor to deal with only this. So maybe so this is pretty old. This is 1999. Markets have evolved a lot since then. Like we're in 2019. I believe that back then, they didn't have market monitoring departments. 
So these prices we're seeing here is without without a watchdog there. Okay? There was no market monitoring department. If you repeat the same exercise today, I don't think that you will see this. There is FERC. Today, you know, firms go to court. So I'm not sure if this is reality today. And I'm sure that maybe in some hour this happened, but I, I don't believe that FERC will let this happen. And this, no way. It doesn't, and that's not what happened. Okay. So, so if you want to undertake a regulatory action that you need to, there are elegant ways to do it, basically. Maybe more elegant than just say cost based market. That's what I'm saying. Unfortunately, we need to finish, otherwise they will get a, the, micro, the microphone okay. so I think we are pretty okay. good with that. Thank you so much. Thank you.